When we are looking at the biblical teaching from the beginning to the end, we, we find easily one very interesting, significant part of the biblical story. The church of Jesus Christ is the primary reason God created the universe. When we look at the beginning of time, we see God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when we go fast forward and when we go to the very end of everything which, which the Bible tells about, we see the Trinity plus the church. So this huge period of time during which we see the universe uh, was created and then we see the whole history is developed, being developed before our eyes. And we see that all the empires and everything which had been done here, here on earth has one and only one purpose, creating a bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. So in this sense, everything else, what happens here on earth, is much less significant than the process of building up the church. So when God is calling us, when he is saving us, he makes us participating in the greatest uh, enterprise which is ever being done in this universe. I decided to have three sermons, and uh, all of those sermons will be focusing on the church, on different areas of church. Today we will speak about the church church's majesty and beauty, as I just told, we, we need to get, Im get ourselves immersed into the nature of the church, that we, we as uh, very uh, directly participating in the life of the church and in God's plan, he sees us as uh, instruments of building up the church. We need to understand the nature of the church before we can approach to the next subject. And next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll be talking about the elders and pastors, who they are and what to expect of them and what is our relationship to them. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll focus on the deacon ministry. And that's another part of our process of development. We are rethinking our approach to the whole structure and we really believe that this is what Lord is doing. Lord is leading us through this stage of our life now. The main text of this short series of sermons will be Ephesians 4. Turn with me, Ephesians 4, and we will read verses 1 through 16. We will focus on these specific verses, although we will be touching some other passages of scriptures which speak about this. If you remember, if you studied New Testament epistles, you know that most of them are written in, in one particular order. The first portion focuses on doctrinal part where uh, the author, biblical author, explains the foundation of salvation. He presents the gospel. He presents the doctrinal truth which are important for us to understand the gospel, to understand the church, to understand our salvation. And in second part, usually in every epistle, we see the practical application of the gospel or the practical part, how that affects our lives, how that is being reflected in our lives, how it brings forth fruit in our lives. So chapter 4 is the beginning of second part. If the begin, is the beginning of the part 2, the practical application of the gospel in our life. This is why Paul is starting this part with the word therefore. I therefore, because of everything which he, he just taught in the first three chapters, I therefore, because of the gospel, because of what Christ had done for us, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to, to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and, the, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
But, the, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Uh, he who descended is the one who uh, also ascended far above all the heavens that he might, might feel all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about the, by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As I just told that after completing the doctrinal part, uh, Apostle Paul starts his practical application with this very important point. He starts with the church. He describes our relationship to the church, and he underlines and emphasizes that this relation plays a huge, very significant role in the whole spiritual development. We need to understand them, and we need to see what Christ had designed for us in terms of our role and our place in his bride, in the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church. In this passage, I see three facets that we need to look at uh, this, this morning. We, we, we see several important elements that God, the Holy Spirit, is communicating to us, teaching us about the church. The number one, he is saying about great calling. This is actually what he is starting with. Look here, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There are many different meanings of the word calling. Different people see themselves in different light when they understand, when they apply this word to themselves. If I would ask you, what is your calling? Some people see their calling in motherhood. Some people see their calling in great career or doing something good for humanity or maybe in political ambitions or many different things, thousands of things, how people see their calling. But here, Apostle is saying about the calling for every Christian. When a person comes to Christ, when you experience the saving work of the Holy Spirit, which applies the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross to your soul, when he gives you Holy Spirit, your calling is changed. And we need to understand that every Christian has received from God a special, very specific calling. And now he is saying that he is asking us to walk in the manner worthy of calling. In order to understand what this calling is, let me take you back into chapter 1 of the uh, Ephesians, book of Ephesians. Turn with me in your Bible. Please open your Bibles. I, I want you to see it in your Bibles and maybe underline that, that we would be able to see the progression of thought. And it's a very important truth that we need to understand. It builds up our whole framework of understanding of the church and our place in the church. The Paul starts with a very interesting statement in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Look with me. He's saying, therefore, uh, he's saying, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
So this is an important statement. If you remember in chapter 2, he is saying about our sinfulness, about our deadness in sin. He is saying about our problems that we as sinners have, all of us. But here, beginning of his epistle, he wants to communicate to every believer, hey, you are blessed. And that's a very important thing. We have that problem, common problem of deficiency and understanding of who we are in Christ. We are measuring our lives by the success of others, by uh, ideologies, by values, by different uh, ide ideological moves which are around us. And quite often we measuring up ourselves against all of that we are being lost and he is communicating from the very beginning he wants to understand hey if you are in Christ you are blessed and he is underlining here look what he is saying with every spiritual blessing God himself the creator of the universe he is taking care about you dear soul that he had blessed in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, he blessed you, my friend, with every spiritual blessing. And after that, he gives us three concrete expressions of that, those blessings. The blessing number one we find here in verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So he wants to understand the number one blessing that we as Christians who had been saved, the number one blessing that we have, he made us his sons and daughters. You know, quite often in some of the Christian circles and some radical Christian circles, People are misusing the phrase when they say we are uh, children of the king. We, uh, uh, and therefore, we, we must have the most uh, expensive cars and we must have the, the best houses and all of that. So they are misusing and misrepresenting that whole idea. But in reality, we need to understand, yes, it is true, we are children of the king. Even more than a king, we are children of the God of the universe. And that became possible only because Jesus Christ had died on the cross and he made us God's sons and daughters. So he wants us to understand, to live with that understanding. This is the greatest blessing that we can have here on earth. The blessing number two, which he gives us here, is we find in verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That's another important thing. Yes, we are children of God. Yes, it's true. But we are quite, uh, quite imperfect children of God. We often fail. We often sin. We often, often make mistakes, which kind of piles up on our understanding of ourselves and we kind of get lost under the pressure for our own uh, infirmities, uh, our own problems. And he, is, he wants to communicate, hey, in Jesus Christ, he made you perfect. Look what he's saying. He redeemed us through his blood. All our sins, all our mistakes, Everything which we do wrong, he had died for us at the cross, and because of that, he forgave us our trespasses. That's another important element that we need to understand. So he wants, he wants to communicate that richness of the blessing that we have in Christ. But it's not all. The number three, he's saying here in verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. In Jesus Christ, we have obtained inheritance. What is inheritance? Inheritance is something which God the Father 
had prepared for God the Son in eternity. And you know what he had prepared for him in eternity? He had prepared for him the church. The glorified, that, that's an amazing thing. From the eternity past, God decided to create a bride for his church. And he decided that this, this bride would consist of people, of living souls who had been created by the image of, in the image of, of God who will be people, they are creation, but they will have an opportunity in God's provision, in God's providence, to be united with God's spirit and to be lifted up in glory to the level of glorified son and to be an absolutely inseparable part of the son for the eternity. And he wants us to understand that. He wants us to measure our life through that. He wants us to approach our destiny, our understanding of future, our hope, our view of our lives, what we, are, what we live in, the meaning of our lives, through that lens. He wants us to understand that. And of course, we often forget about it. We often we are missing that. We kind of focus our attention to some different things. This is why Paul is praying about that. Look with me, verse 15, in the same chapter. Verse 15, he continues on and he says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And this is what he's praying about. That the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Look at me. Here calling again. He is saying about that calling. And he is praying that we would be able, that God's Spirit would give us an ability to understand that calling, to understand the glory of that call, calling, the importance of what, what he had called us to. And he continues on. What, we are, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And then he continues in verse 19, explaining that hope of our calling and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right and his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is a hope of our calling. So when we are looking at our lives and when we are looking to the fulfillment, to find fulfillment in our lives, this is the end result. This is what God had created us for in Jesus Christ, to become part of his body, which is the fullness of him who fills on all in all. If we continue on in uh, chapter 2, we, we see the uh, more detailed explanation of what he just presented here. Uh, you remember that he's saying that, that we had been saved by grace, not by works. And uh, verse 8, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Look with me what he is saying here. He is, he is very clearly stating here that it is not a result of works in the beginning of verse 9. Our salvation is not a result of works. But we have been created, at the end of the very, second part of verse 10, in Jesus Christ, so we had been called out of our sinfulness, we had been regenerated, we had been born again, not because of our works, but we had been born again for good works. And these, these good works are participating in what God is doing. And he explains it in the, later, uh, in the end of this chap chapter, later portion of this chapter. Uh, read the verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in, into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. So he explains our place in the church. When a Christian is saved, he is immediately placed, or when the soul is saved, he or she is immediately put into the connection with, with all other brothers and sisters, with all other church members, and Holy Spirit continues on to working on our hearts. If you are a Christian, since the beginning of your Christian life, God the Holy Spirit is working on you, trying to make you, what he is explaining here, are being built together. He is working on you, making you a fitting part of the Holy Temple, of the body of Christ. And that work of the Holy Spirit continues on all the time. So he explains that. Then in chapter 3, in chapter 3, he explains that uh, the work uh, of, of God in our hearts, uh, making us part of his church, is actually the work of the Holy Trinity. Now, God the Father predestined that, that we will be part of the church. God the Son died at the cross, and he made us actually uh, sons and daughters of God. And God the Holy Spirit is working on us, making us fitting part of his body. And in chapter 3, we read a very interesting thing, verses 10 and 12, through 12, that the church is the main display of God's glory or God's wisdom, God's tremendous wisdom in the spiritual world. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places through the church. Angels, cherubims, seraphims, all the hosts of angelic, angelic creatures in the universe, actually holy angels and those evil angels or demons, God is displaying his glory and displaying his majesty and displaying his, the top of his creative work through the church. This is how important it is for the Lord God. And then in verses 20 and 21, he's explaining what, what happens in the heart of the believer when Christ is living in him and when, he, when we grow up in, in the Christ's life. He explains, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly that all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, that works at work within us, to him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So this is how chapter 3 ends. And now chapter 4 starts. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So he, he builds up that case. He, he describes the importance of the church for the Lord, for God, for us, for the universe. And then after saying all of that, explaining all of that, he comes to us and, and says, hey, therefore, 
Therefore, you need to walk according to the calling. Our calling is to build the church of Jesus Christ. That's the most important calling which, which is possible for human beings. And we need to understand that and we need to see that this is what is the most important thing God is doing here in this universe. So that's the first part. The first part, a great calling. Now let's turn to the second one. Explaining that, he comes to another important element, amazing unity. This is something that he decided to, to talk about before he goes on explaining what the um, practical life according to the calling is. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Actually, a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night, Sergei Lange delivered a great sermon on this topic. So if you, if you understand Russian, I believe it's not in English. Uh, that's a good sermon to listen on this passage. I would recommend you to do that. So the apostle does not call here to create unity. He is not calling here to achieve unity. He is not saying here, hey, we need to come together and to negotiate and to find common ground. And then we can build our unity. No, he is saying here that we have unity, which we need to preserve. And he explains what this unity is. But before saying that, let me emphasize uh, that we are different. We are. God had created human beings in a very interesting way. From the very beginning, you know how, how human being starts? Two cells, which bear two different DNAs. They come together, and as a result, new set of DNAs appear. Completely unique. We have billions of people who live on earth. And God had created and designed humanity in such a way that every human being is distinct. It's unique. Unique set of DNA. And according to that, all people have different bodies, different intellectual abilities, different emotional characteristics and add to their different environment where people grow up and let, uh, add to the different conditions some people have conditions for education some, some not so we are different we are different in our social status we are different in our nationalities languages we are different in our Tastes. Some people like one thing, other people like different things. We are different in our political preferences. We are diff different in our understanding of arts and, and sociology and the life itself. So we are so different. And add to that one more area of differences. When we come to Christ, different enough, when we come to Christ and start, accept Christ and start to grow in Christ, we grow not even then. Some people grow faster, other people slower. Some people grow faster in one area, another person grows faster in, the, in another area. For some people it takes just one time understanding of things and he, he, he gets it, and he understands it, and he repents, and he comes to Christ and asks his power and strength to do differently, and here we see the different area of life. And for other people, and you can find yourself in that list, something like you know for sure that when you had been offended, you need to forget, forgive. 
You know that you are trying, you pray that God give you strength and power, and something happens again, and you find yourself it's difficult to do that. Or for, for other people, it's different, difficult to control their tongue. It's just way easier for them to speak out whatever they think, and quite often they speak something which they should probably should not do, should not speak. And there are thousands of those areas, and every one of us presents some mosaic of very huge differences. And that, that's an important thing that we need to understand. But Apostle Paul is saying that despite all of these differences, we are one. This is God's design. Despite all of those differences, and I just did not have time to list all of them. And if I would have time for that, I would miss some of them. Because there are so many of them. We are different. And despite all of them, we have real objective unity. And he describes that unity by bringing our attention to seven pillars. These pillars they really exist. They have been provided by God through Jesus Christ. Let me go quickly over them. Number one, one body. The church of Jesus Christ is not a collection of different bodies. There's only one body. There's only one Christ. There is only one universal church to which every person saved by Christ belongs. Christ had died at the cross, keeping in mind one church. And everyone who is truly born again, who had been redeemed by Christ, everyone is part of that church. Different, not like us. In his own process or point of the process of becoming Christ-like. But he or she part of the same body that you and I. That's the first part. Second, one spirit. I just mentioned that we are in the process of work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts where he is building us into the church of Christ, making us fitting. And that's an important thing, that it is impossible to become a Christian without Holy Spirit. But there is only one Holy Spirit, which means... Everyone who became a Christian had been touched and had been regenerated by the same Spirit. And when Spirit does that, it's not like he came, regenerated, and left. No, no, no. It's not like that. He comes and stays. He lives with us. And that means that if he lives in you, then he lives in all, everybody else who had been redeemed and regenerated. That's the nature of the church of Christ. So the Paul wants us to understand this is the unity. It's not the foundation for unity. It's a real unity. It's a real unity that we have. We quite often forget about it. Or we missed it. We don't keep it in mind. But this is real unity. Quite often... Children don't like their parents in something what parents do. But at that mo moment, they do not become not their children. They are still their children. It could be proven genetically. Even if, even if they, they would say, no, I don't like my parents. This is what happens with the Church of Christ. Then he continues on and he says about one hope. We all have common future. Looking forward, we have one hope, and this is the hope of eternal triumph in the glorified body of Christ in everlasting fellowship with God. There's only one kingdom of God. There's no special kingdom for you and those people who, uh, who you like. There's just one kingdom of God for all who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, only one Jeru New Jerusalem, only one people, one nation, 
and we are going all going to the same place. And then he, he continues on and he says about one Lord. So when we believe in Christ, we recognize him as our master, our Lord. We understand, we repent. This is why repentance is a very important part of, of salvation. We repent, which means we reject our own ego, our own, our self. And we understand that He, Jesus, is the head of our life. And now we need to understand everyone who had been saved served the same head, the same Lord. This is what Paul is writing here. Then one faith. There is only one way to Jesus and salvation, the gospel. So all of the people who became Christians, they came through that narrow gate of trusting into Jesus according to the gospel. There's no other way to become a Christian. So all of us who had been redeemed, who came to Christ, who understand him, all of us came through the same narrow road. Then the uh, next to last one, one baptism. Baptism is, is the result of faith. In response of a person who had been saved, that, that person, he declares that he had died for himself when he is being put under water. And when he or she is taken out from the water, he or she declaring that I live for Christ. And he says there is only one baptism. All of us who are truly Christians, who had been baptized, all of us declare that oneness that we all had died for ourselves, that we would be able to live for Christ. And the last in his list, conclusion, the seventh pillar of the unity, one God and Father. One salvation is conceived, initiated, and carried out by God, the creator of heaven and earth. And there is only one God. So those seven pillars... Of course, each of them deserves more study in depth. And, and I actually pray about opportunity to preach through Ephesians. It's a very rich epistle. Maybe one day we can do that. But at that point, that's, that's enough for us just to show the real objective unity. And he's saying that we need to maintain that unity. Look with me at verse 3. Well, let's start from verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is another very good translation of the Bible. The version is called Net Bible. And it's translate, it translates this verse in the in, in following way. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's the idea. So that unity does exist. It is there. But God requires from us making conscious effort to maintain that unity. And in order to do that... It's being done with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. And again, this is a rich portion of Scripture which requires our attention and hopefully we, we can do it one day. Very interesting thing. But now we, we want to see the bigger picture and I want to come to the next verse, verse 7, which speaks to us about unique gifts. So we, we were saying, we were looking at great calling, which is the God gave us a calling to become part of his church, the glorified state of humanity. And then we see the amazing unity in the church. Amazing unity which is built supernaturally, not according to our preferences, to our abilities, but by Christ, God the Father, what he had done through Christ, and he maintains it through the Spirit. And now we come to the unique gifts. Oh, that's a very interesting thing. The next verse starts with very interesting short word, but. But grace. 
So he, he just explained those seven pillars of unity. And now he adds something more which makes us different. In addition to what we already have, we, as, as I just uh, mentioned, all of those differences that we have, in addition to that, when we come to Christ, God makes us different even more. And that difference is related to his gifts of grace. That's an important thing. But grace was given to each of us each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's a very interesting thing. He's saying that grace had been given to us. Grace means undeserved gift. So whatever God is giving to us, making us able to participate in his glorious work of building up of his church, making us able to cooperate with him in the greatest project in the universe. Whatever abilities we have from him, we have received it undeservedly. We do not, we do not deserve it. We receive it by grace. And God is saying that it comes to us entirely from the God's loving heart. God loves us. And because of his love, he decided to graciously give us those gifts. And when we are speaking about grace, we understand that we cannot dictate to the grace giver. That's absolutely not of us. It's of him. It's his own wisdom and his heart and his love toward us. And he designed the whole church. And in that church, he designed specific place for every individual. He knew you from the eternity past. He knew who you will be. He knew your DNA. He knew where you will live and he knew what kind of body you will have and what kind of IQ you will have and what church you will be in and what are people who will be around you. And he specifically designed sets of gifts for you. Unique gifts that he had prepared for you and me. And that's God's grace. Grace that he not only lifting us up from the uh, pit of uh, our sinful and uh, life of death or, or deathness, deadness in our sins. He, he not just lifting us up to the place where we could barely survive. No, he is taking us up at the position where we become his partners. He makes us his co-workers. He makes us his co-creators, if we could say. So he gave us creative power. We have creativity as an image of God. And in order to do that, he gives us his own sets of gifts. This is what he's saying. And that's a very interesting thing because when we understand grace, we understand that God himself discerned, discerned the types of gifts, number of gifts, the measure of gifts that he gives to every person. And this is absolutely wrong when we start to compare ourselves with other people. When we try to measure up ourselves by other people, yeah, they are more glorious, they are more gifted, they are more famous, they are more doing something. No, absolutely not. Because you are in the same level of importance before God's eyes than the, the most glorified person in your mind. He gives us, but the grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. This is why we cannot glory in, inside of other people that we consider less than us. And we should not envy. 
when we look at other people and see they are greater than us. It is absolutely foundless. We don't have a foundation for that approach. We had received grace according to the measure of his gifts. That's a very interesting thing when Apostle Paul is speaking about self in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. If you remember, he compares himself to other apostles. And he says that yeah, Jesus uh, ex uh, appeared to Peter, you remember, to uh, James. And then he says, and finally to me. And he says, I'm even unworthy to be called an apostle. And here, at this place, he's saying a very important thing. He's saying verse 10, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this is one of the very important truths that we need to understand. We need to come to that very deep conviction, deep understanding that God had created me who I am. And he had given to me his gifts. And by the grace of God, I am who I am. And look what he is writing there. And the, his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. So when we understand God's grace to us, his gracious gift to us, and when we use them for his glory, that's the most beautiful uh, situation where we can find ourselves. That's the best position for, for human life. I said it like that. It makes no difference in what place and in what position we serve God. The main thing is that we serve in accordance with the gifts that we have received from Him. This is something that we need to understand. This is something what Scripture is communicating here. Every one of us. These are very important words. We all differ. And this is connected not on, only to the level of spiritual development, as I just mentioned, but to, the, to God's design. God designed, and He, according to His design, He gave us different gifts. And when it happens, verse 16, which we read in the beginning, Ephesians 4, 16, states, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Look what is here. He is describing here that each part is working properly. Every part is different, but when we work properly, when we serve Christ, we uh, together we, we create that harmony we add something which is lacking we bring the diversity as something which creates the whole the fullness of the body of Christ this is a blessing the apostle Peter is saying about that in first Peter chapter 4 verse 10 he says as each has received the gift use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So you have received His grace. Be a good steward of it. Use it. Serve one another. Serve in the church. Serve for the purpose of God which He has for the church. This is the essence of real and blessed Christian life. And explaining the unique design of the church... Paul comes to the very important element. He emphasizes specific giftedness which God had prepared for certain people within the church. Yes, all of us different. All of us have gifts from God. But there are some people who have more specific gifts. This is what he is saying. Verse 11. And he gave meaning Christ, giving gifts. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. So in the vast mosaic of gifts found in the body of Christ, there are individuals 
who have been assigned position of leadership by God. And they are not receiving just position. No, they had been created for that. They have received unique set of gifts. And it's very clear here, we can see it. Uh, first of all, we see that it's, uh, it had been determined by Jesus Christ according to his will. So it's not we who decide who has what gifts. It's him. And these gifts are unique. Let me illustrate it. We see in this list apostles, the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and prophets, they were numbered number of people. It's, it's a very limited number of people who had been laying the foundation of the church. Yeah, I know that some people call themselves apostles now, but they are fake apostles. They are not true apostles. Why? Because we read in Ephesians 2, we already read it, read it uh, verses 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So there are New Testament apostles and New Testament prophets, and they had received unique gifts of presenting, of uh, receiving from God and presenting to the people new revelation of God, new revelation about Christ, about the gospel, about the foundation of the church. And this is why we have, as a result, New Testament. New Testament is not continued to be written now. Why? Because only few people have received those gifts from God which make them able to write the infallible, incorruptible, inspired Word of God. So that was given once, there were just a number of people, and it is not repeated. No other people in the history of the church had received those gifts. Why? It's not needed now. It was needed then. It's not needed now. And in the same list, he speaks about another or other group of people who had received God, God's uh, gifts. Look with me once again. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So those two first, the apostles and the prophets, as we just mentioned, that they had been limited to one period of time in the church life. And those others, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, they are also limited. Not everyone, the shepherds and teachers. There are some limited number of people who had been given those gifts for the specific purpose. By the way, it's very interesting. My next sermon would be, Lord willing, focused on this particular verse and verses after that. And we will study it in depth that you see that uh, the English structure expresses well the original language here. You see that there is an article before the apostles then the prophets, then the evangelists, one article, and then two words combined with one article, the shepherds and teachers. And that in Greek language me means that it's, this is two characteristics of one person. So shepherds are teachers. They are teaching the church. They are leading the church. They are, look what is here, equipping the saints for the work of, work of the ministry. And Lord willing, we will be studying that in, in depth next time if, if we'll, have, uh, we'll be alive and have uh, health and every opportunity for that. So when pastors and teachers teach or faithfully fulfill the task given to them to God, by God, God is using them as his instruments and the church grows and develops. We read the uh, following verses, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways of carried about every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craft, craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head of Christ, into Christ. 
So that's the life of the church, which is uh, which becomes possible if. If pastors, evangelists, teachers, they are in the right place. They are right people, and they are doing right work. And then verse 16, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We just described that, the gifts that we receive from the Lord, they come only from God. We cannot give those gifts to other people. These gifts cannot be received in seminary. You cannot train people who have gifts, who do, who do not have gifts. You cannot train gifts in. It's not possible. God gives those gifts. And we as a church, we have responsibility and we have privilege to recognize those gifts. You know, we have musical ministry and uh, Joey, our great leader of music ministry, he uh, uh, recruits other musicians. And in order to participate in music ministry, you need to have several conditions. And one of those conditions, you have to be able to do music. You have to hear music right, you have to produce, you have to be able to produce music. So um, he determines if you fit to that ministry or not. There are a lot of very good Christians who are deaf tone or tone deaf. They, they just don't understand. They don't see the difference between that music or this music. They are excellent Christians, but they are just created for different ministry, not for the music ministry. In the same way for, for pastors. There are specific gifts. And we need to be able to recognize them. And this is not just our responsibility, I mean existing pastors. This is the responsibility of all of us. This is why we ask you. We ask you to, to spend more effort, put more effort and spend more time in prayer during these several weeks. Actually, we, we decided to make this specific week for specific prayer for the leadership of the church. But this process will take several months and and I would like to ask all of us, pray about your own heart, that God would, be, would enlighten your heart with his truth, number one. Then he would work in your heart with the Spirit, that you would be capable to fulfill your role in recognizing the gifts of those people who are becoming new pastors in our church. That's a very important work, ministry, responsibility of everyone, every member of the church. We have a several plan, a certain plan for that. It's, it's approximate, uh, but, but this is a plan how we, we move now. And I, I would like to show it to you, that you would know what we are doing and where we are. So this, uh, we have, now we have sermons about pastors and deacons, after this sermon, I told you that, Lord willing, I will be preaching next sermon on, about pastors and next Sunday about deacons, about that. That's another important ministry. Then we'll have theological test for each candidate. At this point, we have three candidates who have been in the process of preparation for the uh, ordination as pastors, for recognition. Ordination mean, means that we as a church recognize that these people have, have God-given gifts. And we recognize that, yes, they are. How it's being done, I just told you. We are being enlightened by the Word of God. There is no other way. So the Word of God brings light into our hearts and we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, 
would enable, uh, enable us to understand particular person in correct way through the lens of scripture. That we would be able to say, yes, how I understand walking before the Lord, yes, this person has the gifts for this important ministry. So theological tests, you know, when scripture requires uh, of uh, pastors and elders understanding of, uh, of the sound teaching of the gospel. So they need not just understand that, that they have to be able to teach others, number one, and to protect the church from error. They have to have deeper understanding of the word of God and ability to articulate them. So probably, we're not sure yet, but most likely, when we will be doing this exam, we'll make it open for everyone to, to attend. So you can come and you can listen to that exam, that, those examinations. After that, we'll have interview at the family service. Most likely, it will be in June's family service. And every one of you, every one of us, would be able to ask questions at each candidate. What are your views on that? How you understand that? What is your experience in that? And all of that. That's, that's a process that we propose. Then we'll be church voting for each candidate. And then at the end, we plan to have an ordination service at the church day. When church comes together, and then we will have that expression that we as a church understand what God is doing and we recognize these people as pastors and elders in our church for our church. So as you understand, it's a very, very important stage of our life, life of the church. And because of that, I ask you to pray. Pray not just this week. Pray specifically about your heart. Pray about all the church members. Pray about those brothers. And we'll present them uh, quite soon. And that's, that's an important thing that we need to understand that we as a church have that unique opportunity at this point to participate in what God had uh, commanded us to do. That we as a church would install those new pastors and elders in our church. So that's, that's the teaching that Paul is presenting here in this passage. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit that he would help us to understand it deeply and he would help us to live according to that. Let us kneel down and spend a minute on two in, or two in quiet in a prayer. Just try to think about everything that you had heard and we had talked about and come to the Lord and Ask his blessing for our church at this stage of uh, our lives. Our Lord God, we thank you for your salvation. Thank you for saving us from our sins, from the depth of hell. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for sending your only son to die for us. Thank you, Lord, for making us part of your church. Thank you, Lord, for our local church, our congregation. Thank you for your provision, for your protection, for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We are not perfect, Lord. And we thank you for giving us Christ, 
who made us your sons and daughters. And he did it because of grace. Because of your loving heart. Not because we deserve it, but because you had done that. Lord, thank you for your word which protects us and enlightens us and gives us understanding of our responsibility at this stage of our life. And we come to you and we ask your additional grace that you would continue to work in our hearts, that you would enable every one of us to understand you and your word, to understand your will, to understand what you are doing today and what place you see for every one of us in your church. We know, Lord, that this is the most glorified position. This is the greatest privilege that is possible here on earth to be a participant of your holy work of building up your church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Help us, Lord, not just to understand that but to be a living part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.